Hello, welcome to This Side of the Ceiling. I'm Kelsey. And I'm Jill. And we're two good friends trying to live this life on this side of the ceiling as abundantly as Christ has called us to. We are by no means experts, but we love to study His Word and share everything that He has revealed and taught us. So come along with us as we open up the scriptures and dive into His wonderful Word. Welcome to This Side of the Ceiling. Uh, if you're joining us, uh, we left you the last time we talked. We le- we're talking about David, a man after God's own heart, and we want to have a heart after God's own heart. And so uh, we're studying David because there's lots to um, learn from David's life. And his heart was not per- his life was not perfect, right. uh, but his heart was after God. And we left him in a no-win situation. Um, we are in First Samuel, and in chapter 28, uh, David has gone to live with the Philistines. He's actually following his own heart. Uh, he's running away from Saul because he's afraid. Uh, God has been protecting him. God has told him he'll be king, but David's afraid. And David uh, says, Saul's going to kill me. And so he goes, and he is living with the enemy. Mm-hmm. Um, and... The enemy thinks that he's out raiding, um, you know, for the Philistines. But really, he is out raiding for the, the, the promised land that God had promised to the Israelites, some of this that they hadn't taken yet. So mm-hmm. David has got a... he's place spinning. <laughs> that's right. He's playing both sides, and it has come to a head. Because the Philistines are feeling very confident. Now the, the big warrior of the Israelites is on their side. And God has left Saul. So Saul is scrambling. Philistines are coming after the Israelites. Saul knows it. You know, the last we left Saul talking to a witch, you know, trying to say, bring up Samuel to tell him what to do. So he's scared. And David has said he's going to go fight with the Philistines. He's kind of been a little ambiguous because the the king says, come with us. And he says, oh, I'll show you what I can do. <laughs> We're kind of ambiguous. But that's where we've left David. And he's in this no-win situation because if he goes and fights with the Philistines, he'll be forced to put to death his, his own people, right. God's people, that he's been told he'll be king over. He hasn't done that yet. But if he says, I can't fight against my own people, then then his ruse is up with the Philistines because they think he's been loyal to them. So that's where we find him. And unless the Lord intervenes, he's, he's in trouble. Right. So let's read the first, uh, let's read 1 Samuel 29, 6 through 11. So Achish called David and said to him, As surely as the Lord lives, you have been reliable, and I would be pleased to have you serve with me in the army. From the day you came to me until now, I have found no fault in you, but the rulers don't approve of you. Turn back and go in peace. Do nothing to displease the Philistine rulers. But what have I done, asked David? What have you found against your servant from the day I came to you until now? Why can't I go and fight against the enemies of my lord the king? Achish answered, I know that you have been as pleasing in my eyes as an angel of God. Nevertheless, the Philistine commanders have said, He must not go up with us into battle. Now get up early along with your master's servants who have come with you and leave in the morning as soon as it is light. So David and his men got up early in the morning to go back to the land of the Philistines, and the Philistines went up to Jezreel. Okay, so the Lord intervenes, and David is rescued from this predicament. But I don't know that it sits well with David, because David is a warrior, and he is observing neutrality, which just seems to go against everything in his nature. So he's been sent back home, and I, you know, he just, that's unusual for David to Mm -hmm. have to sit this one out. But things are not what they seem. So let's just keep reading because when David goes back home, he is now, he's still in the land of the Philistines. But remember, he couldn't, he couldn't live with the enemy. He just couldn't live with them. He had to get apart away from them. And so he asked for his own land and they gave him a town of Ziklag in the Philistine um, land. And so David is headed back with his men to headed home to the women and the children. So let's read the first six verses of chapter 30. Okay, David and his men reached Ziklag on the third day. 
Now the Amalekites had raided the Negev and Ziklag. They had attacked Ziklag and burned it, and had taken captive the women and all who were in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on their way. When David and his men came to Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire, and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. David's two wives had been captured, and Hoam of Jezreel and Abigail the widow of Nabal of Carmel. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters, but David found strength in the Lord his God. Okay, there's some stuff here we should talk about. Um, So David returns to Ziklag, and note the irony here. David has been going off raiding. And raiding these cities, and now he's left his t- home, his city unprotected, and it's been raided. Right. And so, you know, this is just what they did back in those days. And so you've got the Amalekites. Now, we have seen the Amalekites before, and thought you can go back to the beginning of the Israelites, and God says, I'm going to destroy all the Amalekites. And he tells Saul to do it, and Saul doesn't. That's Saul's right. first big mistake. And so these Amalekites come, and they are evil people. And so when the men realize that their women and their children are gone, they're right to imagine the worst. Mm-hmm. I mean, they they can't imagine that their women and children have been treated nice. With or the, that they're alive. Or that they're they yeah. Known that. They wouldn't know if they were alive, no telling what they've had to experience. Their, their women may have been raped. Who knows? And so... We see pain in that. I mean, that's a really sad verse where it says that the people raised their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. They are in pain. Mm -hmm. And we want to talk a little bit about that today um, because, you know, life is loaded. We we never know when we're going to walk home to something like that. Uh, We're all just, you know, one phone call, one diagnosis, one accident away from weeping our... Until we can't weep anymore. Until we can't weep anymore. And, and, um, you know, and sometimes, though, we seem surprised when that happens. And yet, Scripture tells us over and over to not be surprised that we're going to have that in this world. Yeah. Jesus even said that in this world you will have trouble. But, uh, but take heart, I have overcome the world. That's right. And that, that is where we can, have, we can take heart. But we, we seem so surprised. You know, I think as, as a mother, sometimes when your child comes home and, and says, oh, so-and-so hurt my feelings, we want to go, well, why did they do that? Right. I can't believe they did that. And go try to fix it instead of saying, I'm sorry, honey, now you've realized that in this world you're going to have trouble. You know, that's just what Jesus told us. And so I, I think sometimes we are surprised. Um, but, but if you read anybody's story in the Bible, there, mm-hmm. is, there, is, there is times of pain, great pain. Mm-hmm. Um, but in this story, we see two different reactions to that pain. Um, and so life is loaded but God is sovereign over that, and God can use the pain for a good purpose. And in this case, you see that the people are ready to stone David. Now, this is, these are the people that have run to David. They have been fighting for David, and they turn on him very quickly because they're hurting. These right. are their family. And so they're ready to stone him because it says they were bitter in their soul um, because for their children. Right. So the people, um, you know, hurting people often find someone to blame. Right. You know, who did mm-hmm. this to me? And David. Right. It's you. And so that pain has to go lash somewhere. Out. Yes. And so uh, you see these hurting people lash out at David. Now, David's hurting too. He's lost his wives. He's lost, um, we don't have children mentioned at this point, but he's lost his family. And, um, but he turned somewhere different. We see David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. And I think here, this David's pain wakes him up. Mm-hmm. Because in this whole time that he's been living with the Philistines and going off raiding, we've not heard him talk about God. 
and here we see him turn to God. And if the first thing he does, he strengthens himself in the Lord. And I, I think that David starts following after God now instead of listening to his own heart. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He's going to strengthen himself in the Lord. And the first thing he does is he tells the priest to bring him the ephod, which is going to help make a decision. And he asks, David asks the Lord, should I go after this band? And David's going to do whatever God says. Should I go after them, Lord? Should I go try to get the children and the women? Notice he doesn't say, let's go, let's go get him. He stops and he asks, should we go? And the Lord says uh, in in verse 8, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake and you shall surely rescue. So David set out and the 600 men who were with him, and they came to the brook where those who were left behind stayed. But David pursued, he and 400 men, 200 stayed behind because they were too exhausted to cross the brook. So, you know, you can imagine what David comes in and says, grab your swords, let's go get them. Right. And I'm sure the people are all about that, you know, so that's a way for the focus their pain. So 600 men, they take off, and God has promised them victory. But the first thing we read about is 200 of them can't do it. Mm-hmm. They're exhausted. They're going fast, and, you know, they're trying to catch up with these people. And so I think we're going to see here in these next few verses that even though they've been promised victory, there's still some work to be done, and it's not going to be easy. Mm-hmm. So they've got this exhaustion. Um, they, they find an Egyptian who, who saw what happened, who leads them to the Amalekites. And so I'm going to jump down to verse 16. This Egyptian takes them. He saw them burn Ziklag and carry everything off. And he says, I know where they are, so they follow him. So verse 16 says, When he had taken them down, behold, they were spread abroad all over the land, eating and drinking and dancing because of the great spoil they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. And David struck them down from twilight until the evening of the next day. And not a man of them them escaped except 400 young men who mounted camels and fled. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had taken, and David rescued his two wives. Nothing was missing, whether small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything that had been taken. David brought back all. David also captured all the flocks and the herds, and the people drove the livestock before him and said, This is David's spoil. So, we see that he strikes them down, but notice how long it was. Did you see how long? Twilight to next day. Yeah, so 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So he has victory, but it's exhausting to get there. They have to fight for 24 hours. Mm -hmm. There's some people that escape. And um, it's not, there's going to be some, uh, the Bible's going to even tell us there's some worthless men in his own camp. So it's not without its struggles. But the good news is God spares the women and the children. Um, And and what a blessing, God's mercy, that um, everything is returned. Yeah. And so that is a huge blessing. Um, and, you know, we we are reminded that this is, this is served to draw David back to God. Um, and yet there's probably so much that was going on in his mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and, you know, when he's dealing, when he turns to God to get his strength... We, of course, get to hear some of his psalms. We don't know exactly when they were written, but I love to peek into David's journal like we've been doing and just see that. But in Psalm 69, it says, You know how I'm scorned, disgraced, and shamed. All my enemies are before you. Scorn has broken my heart and has left me helpless. I looked for sympathy, but there was none. For comforters, but I found none. So he tells God what he's feeling, you know, when he's searching for strength. But then at the end of 69, Psalm 69 and verse 30, he says, I will praise God's name in song and glorify him with thanksgiving, which makes me think that he's singing through his pain. Oh, that's such a good picture. Yeah, that... I mean, he says, I will praise God's name in song. He's probably singing some of these words we read as a psalm. Yeah, yeah, and I can just, I can see how that is helpful because I've done that before. You know, songs are so powerful. Yes. And can really put perspective 
on life and what's happening. And, and it's also a way to cry out to God in some, some songs. So, so I, can, I, I like to read David's words and how he tells God how he's feeling, but then he convinces himself, I'm going to praise God yes. in the middle of this. Yeah. And then in Psalm 13, um, some people call this the howling psalm, but it's when David says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes, or, or I will sleep in death. My enemy will say I have overcome him, and my fo- foes will rejoice when I fall. So he tells God his feelings, but then he asks God to help him see reality, because he's not sure his feelings are reality. He Which says, is the first step, isn't yeah. it? To not mm-hmm. to realize that there are things above my feelings to not put too much value into them right feel them david yeah. feels them right but he doesn't that's not where he determines yeah, he's his even actions asking god how long will you hide your face from me how long must i wrestle with my thoughts but then he asks god for three things look on me answer me and give light to my eyes so he's wanting god to turn his vision toward what god wants for him, what God's doing for him. Um, So yeah, so he asks God for those three things. And then at the end of that psalm, he says, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord for he has been good to me. So he turned his feelings toward God, again, singing probably praises to him. So good. That's really good. Yeah. Um, and, you know, in this story, God did turn his face to him, and he opened his eyes to lead him back to the people, and in his mercy, he gave him everything back. Yeah. I, I want to finish that story because um, there, there's one more thing that I think is interesting about this. So the, the men have got to be thrilled to see that their women are alive, their children are alive. They can't find anything missing. And so that we hear in quotes that the people say, this is David's spoil. David's spoil. And I notice that's what the people say. And so they go back and they're so excited. They've got everybody with them. And then they go back to those those 200 men. Remember, we left 200 exhausted men at the brook. Now look what happens when they get there. I'm going to read verse 22. Then all the wicked and worthless fellows among the men who had gone with David. Now notice, so not everybody (laughs) was... Good. We got some wicked and worthless men who are part of David's group, enjoying all of this. Still, God's mercy returned their women and children. So, the wicked and worthless fellows of the men who had gone with David said, Because they didn't go with us, we will not give them any of the spoils that we have recovered, except that each man can have his wife and children and depart. But David said, You shall not do so, my brothers, with what the Lord has given us. Mm -hmm. So I think that David, like you said, he's above, he sees the bigger picture. This is not my spoils. This is not your spoils. This is what God has given us. Mm -hmm. And David knows who it's from. And David right then and there makes a rule. And he says, we're going to make a rule. And the rule is going to be that we're going to share the spoils with the people that go and the people that stayed and watched and kept the baggage is what he says here, and it says that that was a rule from then on. Um, so I, I think there is a lot from us to learn from this story. We see, I, I'm glad it's not drawn out, you know, it's not very long that they have to worry about their children and their women, um, their wives. Um, but, you know, as we've talked about, life is loaded. There there are things that are going to happen to us, and we, we don't need to, we need to be ready for them. We need to be um, abiding with God so that when those things come, we're ready. Standing on the firm foundation. That's right. That's right. And we're not surprised. We know God said this was going to happen, but I've overcome. And that God is sovereign over pain. He can He can be there with us. He's above it. And that He can use it. He can use it. Um, it can prepare us for our greatest tomorrow. David's about to become king. Right. Uh, he doesn't know it, but Saul and his Jonathan have just died, and so 
it's time for David to ascend. And so these little testings that David's going through, God is using them. Mm-hmm. I, I love the song Blessings by Laura Story. But in that song, she says, What if my greatest disappointments or the aching of this life is the revealing of a greater thirst this world can't satisfy. That's an example of a song that has ministered to you. Just like you were saying, David's songs, I think that's so true. That's a really good line. Um, It's really good. It reminds me of that book by Paul Brand um, that talked about, I think Paul Paul Brand is a doctor, and he wrote a book with... um, Philip Yancey called Purpose and Pain. Mm-hmm. And he was a doctor who studied leprosy and people that had leprosy. And I remember understanding after I read that book that the worst part about leprosy is that you don't feel pain. Mm-hmm. And that we would think, oh, that would be nice to not feel pain. But actually, it's, it's horrible because the people wouldn't know that they had scraped their foot until they would keep scraping it and it would just get down to the bone. Right. Or they wouldn't know that... There was an animal that was attacking them at the night, and they wouldn't know. And so he talks in that book about how important it is for us to feel pain so that we can take care of ourselves. And and in the same way, and hopefully as as you think about this, uh, we can not be surprised, not expect to live our lives without pain, but to realize God is sovereign over pain, and pain can be purposeful, and and we're all going to go through it. Thanks for listening and journeying with us on this side of the ceiling. See you next time.